Thank you, Kathy. Good morning. I love that we're having this in a college, in a school. I feel like I should be going, I am Mrs. Wild. <laughs> Good morning, class. <laughs> so, how many of you are dog trainers? So most of you. How many of you, and you can be more than one, how many of you do like shelter or rescue work? Good. And how many of you are owners who are here to get help for your own dog? Separation anxiety? I know they're like, please. Okay, great. And is that the trainers also? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. This is how the universe keeps trainers humble. Um, I actually, if you notice this beautiful girl up here is my dog, Sierra, who I adopted from a shelter. And I got her when she was probably about a year and a half, two years old. And she is a lovely dog in so many ways, very sweet, no, no destruction, no aggression, nothing like that. But she definitely has a separation issue. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I, I wrote a book about separation anxiety. I wasn't planning to, <laughs> but uh, we had Sierra for a while and my husband looked at me and said, you know what this is, don't you? He goes, it's your next book. <laughs> I said, yeah, thanks. Um, she did not have typical separation anxiety, though. You know, as trainers, we go into homes and we say, okay, you know, you do this, you do that, you do this, and things get better over time as long as the owner is, you know, willing to work on it a little bit. Unfortunately, with Sierra, there were things that she just hadn't read the book, you know? There were things that she was going, well, I know that's supposed to work, but <laughs> yeah, try something else. So I had to get really creative with my approach to fixing this kind of thing. And so my goal today is to give you guys really concrete tips and techniques and things that you can take and use, whether you're a trainer or an owner looking to help your own dog or helping rescue or shelter dogs. Um, with Sierra, I didn't really know that she had a separation issue, obviously, you know, when I brought her home. Although, when they told me at the shelter, when we did the paperwork, well, she's been here four times before. I had an inkling <laughs> that something, something was awry, and I thought, well, she's probably, you know, an escape artist or, you know, whatever. We got her home, and the first thing she did was she, we have kind of a fenced, you know, backyard dog run area. First thing she did was go around and look down at the bottom, look at the top, look at the bottom, look at the top. And I went, okay, so she's an escape artist, no big. I, my background is in working with wolves and wolf dog mixes, and I certainly know how to contain an animal. So I thought, well, we'll, you know, put up the fencing and put in lean-ins and whatever, and it's all good. Well... I would go out and do errands, and she was never destructive, so I left her in the house. We have a dog door. She could go indoors or outdoor. And I would come home after being gone for maybe a half hour, and she wasn't destructive. She hadn't pottied, nothing like that. But I noticed that she was kind of like, <sighs> you know, just really panting. Didn't seem frantic, but she was panting, and it wasn't hot out. And so I thought, well, that's kind of weird. You know, let me set up a video camera and, you know, just kind of see what's going on when I'm away. So I did that, and I went out. I came back 45 minutes later and I reviewed the footage. And it started where she was looking out the window, you know, where I had pulled out of the driveway. And then she walked over to the French doors where you can also kind of see down the hill. And then she went back to the window and she was pacing and she was whining while she paced. And you can imagine as the owner, you know, watching this. And it got kind of more frantic and then there was barking. And then there was kind of really frantic barking. And then it turned into this mournful, pitiful howling. And I mean, and she's part husky. And, and it went on and on. And to be honest with you, after 30 minutes, I couldn't stand to watch it anymore. So I don't know what happened after that. And I actually, you know, the, having the video would have really been helpful. But I was so upset by it that I actually erased it from the camera. And I know those of you who are owners can relate to what I'm saying. So... I went to dinner with a uh, well-known behaviorist who was speaking out where I live. And there was a bunch of people at the table and I ended up sitting next to him. And, I, you know, we were talking about separation anxiety and he actually had a dog who also had separation issues. And I told him, you know, this is what happened with Sierra. And he said, well, is she destructive? And I said, no, not at all. And he said, does she have potty issues? And I said, no, she's never peed or pooed or anything that I know of, you know, not in the house. He said, well, is she barking? Is it, is it bothering the neighbors? And I said, no, our neighbors are kind of, you know, a short distance away. And he said, well, then what's the problem? The problem is that my dog is upset. The problem is that my dog is chronically stressed. Separation anxiety is a very, very serious issue. And whether there are problematic symptoms, you know, for the owner personally, the dog is stressed. And here's the thing, you know, we take like aggression really seriously, right? Owners are like, oh, aggression, you know, that could be life or death for the dog. 
Separation anxiety can be life or death for the dog. At the very least, it can mean that the dog is going to get returned to the shelter or to the rescue because nobody wants to deal with that. So it is something that's not a really quick and easy fix. It is something that takes a dedication, you know, and patience from the owner too. So you'll be hearing a little bit, you know, kind of throughout the day about Sierra and, and my experiences with her, as well as everything that I've learned from doing this with other dogs over the years. By the way, you guys are more than welcome to ask questions. I encourage questions. The only thing I can't answer is like the long case history about your own dog <laughs> during the seminar. You are more than welcome to find me wherever, but, you know, I, I want to make sure we stay on topic. So... This really gave me a new empathy for what owners go through with separation issues. Seeing it from the outside is a lot different than living with it. Living with it 24-7, it's, it's lifestyle threatening. You know, it's not life threatening, but it's a lifestyle threatening. And so, you know, it impacts your every day. You know, everything from I have to go out and do an errand, what do I do with the dog, to wow, I'd really like to go out and have lunch with my friend who's in town and I haven't seen for 10 years, but I can't go because what am I going to do with the dog? So it's really a lot more involved emotionally for the owner than honestly I previously even knew, you know, just from seeing it as a trainer. So again, a cookie cutter approach is not going to work for every dog. So I'm, we're going to go through today what causes it, what can we do about it, what are some tips, and you know, what's new technology that's out there that we can make use of as well. Okay? And again, you guys are more than welcome to ask any questions. So let's talk about first, what is separation anxiety? Can you all see that okay with the lighting in here? Okay, good. So <laughs> how many of you think this dog has separation anxiety? How many of you think this dog does not have separation anxiety? How many of you wish there was coffee? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, just as I suspected. Okay, so this dog looks pretty happy to me. Okay, really cute little golden. He looks kind of proud of himself. <laughs> he probably had a lot of fun tearing up that dog bed. Um, I, I want to kind of talk about what is separation anxiety because a lot of people say, my dog has separation anxiety, right? They'll call a trainer on the phone and say that. And you'll say, okay, well, you know, what makes you say that? I had one guy who called and said, my dog has separation anxiety. And I said, okay, you know, how do you know? Well, you know, that's what the vet told me. I said, okay, well, what did you tell the vet or show the vet that caused him to say that? Well, the dog ate my shoe. <laughs> and... Well, that's enough. The dog ate my shoe, and now he's on medication. That's called, the dog was bored. You know, it may be part of separation anxiety, but certainly I'm not going to say that dog has separation anxiety based on that, right? So we really want to make sure, and separation anxiety as a term is really kind of used as an umbrella term, you know, for everything from mild distress when the person leaves, all the way up to kind of clinical level dogs who are clawing and, and crashing through windows and that sort of thing. Um, so it's fine, but just for the purposes of what we're doing today, if I am alluding to either mild issues or severe issues or moderate, I will say so, so that we, we're all on the same page about that. I do think it's important to distinguish between separation anxiety and what I would call isolation distress. Isolation distress is a dog who just doesn't want to be alone. And very often, if a dog has isolation distress, this is actually a lot easier to solve or to manage than if the dog has real separation anxiety, which is, you know, I just don't want that one person or maybe those people that I'm, I'm so attached to to leave me, okay? Because if the dog has isolation distress, a lot of times, if you have, you know, another person in the family is home, if you have a pet sitter, if you have, you know, even another dog or send the dog to doggy daycare or whatever, that dog's fine as long as he doesn't have to be by himself. So the first thing is, we want to know, is it actually separation anxiety or is it isolation distress? And there's a couple of tests that you can do to differentiate. I mean, a lot of times people know. They're like, you know what, everything's fine, but if that person leaves, we'll watch out. You know, they'll know because they live with it. But if you really don't know or if you're a trainer coming into the home, you might want to, you know, kind of get a gauge if, if they really don't know. So first of all, I mean, obviously we ask people, you know, what happens if nobody's home? Have you videotaped? Do you know what goes on? If one person leaves, is it okay if another person is here? But beyond that, going into the home, what I would do is send the person out of the room. 
I've got the most super yummy treats in the world, and I'm talking like hot dogs, I don't mean like dried dog cookies, you know, maybe natural balance roll, whatever you've got that's really super yummy. Send the person out of the room. I have heard people say, that dog is so attached to me, he won't eat if I'm not here, right? Okay, would you mind going in the other room for a minute? And the dog's like, wow, you've got hot dogs. She never has that, okay? That's not a dog who's panicking that the person left. Now, there are dogs who will say, I don't care what you have, I'm going with her, right? So that's just the first kind of test. If the dog says, well, I'm willing to stay with you and either play, you know, some dogs aren't that food motivated, right? They're more motivated by play. If I, you know, whip out a tug toy and that dog goes, cool, you know my game, and we're playing, then the dog's not that stressed. Dogs are not going to, you know, eat if they're super, super stressed. They're not going to play games if they're super, super stressed. So I, I want to then send the person out of the house, maybe 15 minutes, and see what the dog does. Because they may whimper and whine a little bit and then come and settle down and be okay. You know, a lot of times people are basing their diagnosis of separation anxiety on what they see from the dog as they're getting ready to leave the house. And the dog's going, oh gosh, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're doing your hair, and you're doing this, and I know that means you're leaving, right? And then the dog's kind of whimpering when they leave. And they may even whimper when they hear the person coming back. So the person thinks, oh God, they're, you know, they're upset all the time. And the dog's like having, you know, a party, <laughs> right? So, so you want to make sure that, that we sort of distinguish one from the other. Um, I also want to know what will happen if there's another dog in the house. You know, if, if you have a dog who is not obviously dog reactive, and you have another dog with you that, that gets along with that dog, perhaps you've introduced them outside, what if you leave the two of them, and obviously we would do this with monitoring so that they're not, you know, having a party and shredding the house, is the dog okay? Is he playing with the other dog, or is he still going, wow, I really wish that person would come back? So these are just little things that you can do. Um, to make an accurate diagnosis, you know, there's no medical test for separation anxiety. You can't take a blood test and say, yes, his separation level is 4.3. You know, we need to get that down. It's not going to happen. So what do we do? We have to look at the dog's history. We have to look at mostly the behavior. That's all we have to go by. And I don't always go by just what the owner says, just like about anything else, because sometimes they're not aware. So the best thing to do is it, you have to monitor it somehow. So most people have a video camera, right? Set up a video camera. When you come back, look at the footage. That's the easiest and simplest thing to do. And you have to. You have to in some way find out what that dog is doing when you're not at home. And I don't mean for five minutes, because that doesn't really give you a good accurate assessment. I would say maybe a half hour. If the dog is kind of destructive, you're coming home and finding destruction, then we would do sort of um, real-time monitoring, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, how to do that with the technology that's out there today. Okay, any questions so far? I knew we should have had coffee. <laughs> okay. Um, another thing that's really interesting is that with a separation issue, normally with a separation issue, there's going to be some sort of symptom of it every time the dog is left. You know, if a dog is doing this kind of thing just periodically, and most of the time he's totally fine, more than likely that's not a separation issue. Okay? Because think about it. If you were really, really distressed that somebody was leaving, I mean, put yourself in the dog's place. You're really stressed. Wow, I feel just by myself when the person leaves. I feel a little nervous about being alone. That's not going to happen only every now and then. It's going to happen every time they walk out the door. So again, that's just one more sort of diagnostic tool that you have. This is an example of what I would call an extreme case of separation anxiety. This is actually a dog who was adopted out by a uh, friend of mine, runs the biggest pit bull rescue in the country. Actually, some of you probably know, do you, do you, have any of you watched that Pitbulls and Paroli show? Do you guys know that? Oh, you guys know, okay. So Tia, who was my old rescue partner, um, it used to be wolves and wolf dogs before it was pit bulls, actually. But, but now it's all pit bulls. And, and so she adopted this dog out and found out the hard way that, that this uh, dog had very severe separation anxiety. There were blinds on that window before, and now there's not. The dog tore down the blinds as well. Um, there is also this, which is clawing at the door at the point where the owner's left. This is really common that you're going to see the destruction at the points where the owner's gone, the windows where they can see the doors that the person left through. And the really sad thing is that a lot of times if the dog is really, really stressed, you'll get this type of thing. 
and I don't know how well you can see that with the light, but, but there's actually blood all over on the right side. And I have seen a case like this. I had a case with a boxer who was uh, locked in the garage when they were gone, which was their first mistake. But um, that dog was clawing and, and clawed himself bloody. And this is what dogs will do. They're, they're not in their thinking mind, you know, when they're in this. And this is what I would call severe, obviously. They're not in their thinking mind. They're not going, well, what can I do to bring them back? Bark, bark, bark. It's not that. It's just like a blind panic. It's like the dogs who panic when there's a thunderstorm and they're crashing through windows and all that. It's like that level. It's almost like a phobia. Yeah, and it is very sad. So the most common symptoms of separation anxiety are really destruction. Okay, that, that's what we normally see most followed by vocalization. So the dog is barking, the dog is howling, and very often the first sign that the owner has that there is a problem is that the neighbors complain, right? Um, and then house soiling. And I just want to mention about house soiling that if you don't videotape, here's what can happen. The dog can house soil, and to put it delicately, he can um, then dispose of the evidence. And you come home and go, no, he doesn't pee in the house, he doesn't potty in the house. Yeah, he did. You just don't see it anymore. We talk about hyperattachment with dogs who have separation anxiety. You know the Velcro dogs? You can't even go in the bathroom without them, right? And this is very, very typical to see hyperattachment where the dogs follow you around the house all the time. Now, if you have a dog who follows you around the house all the time, that doesn't mean he necessarily has separation anxiety. And I think that's an important distinction because lots of dogs do that. I mean, you know, they're, they're just under your feet. They're dogs. That's where they are. What are we doing? Are we getting food? You know, doesn't mean they have separation anxiety. And for that matter, just because the dog is destructive or the dog potties in the house, he may not be potty trained fully or he may be taking advantage because you're not there and when you are there and he has a potty accident, you're the one that makes that scary face and throws him outside, right? So he does it when you're not there. So again, you can't take any one symptom and say, this is definitely separation anxiety. The vocalizing, if you think about young puppies, what do they do when they want to bring the mom back? They kind of, oh, 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 you know, whimper and whine. And, and it's kind of repetitive, and then they're listening, you know? And a lot of times when you have vocal, vocalization with separation issues, that's what it sounds like. It's a series of kind of short barks, and then they're listening, and then it repeats again. And that can go on for a really long time, unfortunately. And again, your neighbors will be the first to tell you. Um, I also wanted to mention before we leave the, the issue of uh, the potty thing that if you do have that symptom, you want to make sure to get the dog a thorough vet exam as well because it certainly could be a medical issue. You know, If any of this stuff is um, medical, you, know, you want to make sure right off the bat because you can do behavior modification all day long and if it's a medical problem, you're wasting everybody's time and money, right? We also get pacing, like ritualized back and forth, like you see animals at the zoo, and, and like Sierra was doing from the window to the door and all of that. That's really, really common in a certain pattern where they've seen the people leave. And, and I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you a couple of videos. Uh, drooling, it's interesting. If you have a dog who you put in a crate when you leave, a lot of times you'll come home and there's like puddles in the crate, and people often say, oh, well, that's urine. You know what? A lot of the time, it's not urine. It's drool. They have drooled so much that there's actually a puddle. And the way you can usually tell the difference is that if it is drool, their chest is going to be soaked, their forearms are going to be soaked as well. Okay? Because, I mean, urine, you know, if the dog drinks a lot of water, it can look the same almost. Okay? Uh, and whether or not you should crate a dog who has separation issues is something we're going to be talking about. We also have uh, anorexia, and how many of you, <laughs> I know you haven't had coffee, but play along. How many of you think that a dog who has separation issues will not eat when the person is away? Okay, yeah. Okay, how many of you think that's not true? Again, that's a lot of you who haven't had enough coffee. Okay, so here's the thing. There's a lot of stuff in the literature over the years that's just not true. Okay? That, and I'm going to show you a video of this. It is true that for a lot of dogs, they're so stressed that they will not eat. I, I mean, I give you that. But it is also true that there are plenty of dogs who are stressed that the owner's gone who will eat. So that's the weird thing about this. When I really got into researching this and living with it and, and all of that, I found out that there was a lot of stuff that was in the books that was not actually accurate. You know, just like so many other things with dog training and behavior. Um, some dogs get really lethargic and depressed. 
you know, they, they just kind of shut down when the owner's gone. And those dogs probably won't eat. Those dogs are just kind of like, oh, I'm just so sad. I don't want to do anything. Um, they'll, they may stay in a closet until the owner comes back. They may stay under a bed. A lot of them will hurt themselves. If the dog is really stressed, you know, you saw the blood on the wall there, obviously. A lot of them will also hurt themselves in a crate. If a dog has very severe separation anxiety, I do not recommend putting them in a crate because they will really, really hurt themselves trying to get out. And a lot of the times they'll self-mutilate as well. And, and again, we'll talk more about crates and whether it's a good idea or not. Some dogs will do what I would call self-soothing, which is they will actually find clothing that smells like the owner, which is usually like, you know, your laundry, and they'll kind of get it into a little bundle and they'll make a little nest of it because it has your scent on it. You know, people, it's funny, we all think, people always say, well, my dog chewed the remote. Why? It has your scent on it. You're holding it all the time. So a lot of times it's the stuff that has the owner's scent on it that, that's going to be kind of soothing to them. And we can use that to our advantage, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so what I always find important to explain to people, because there are a lot of people out there who just think, I just want the barking to stop, I just want my neighbors to stop complaining, right? Because that's the symptom of it. Or I just want to stop coming home and finding, you know, things destroyed, which is understandable, believe me, I know or, you know, the potty stuff. But here's the thing, just like with any other behavior issue, it's really important for people to understand that it's not just that we want to make the symptoms go away. We want to make the underlying emotional condition go away. Because then, obviously, you're not going to have the symptoms, but also the dog's going to be healthier and happier. You know, and I really explain to people that, you know what, here's the thing. Yes, sure, you know, they want to put a bark collar on the dog. They want to do this, they want to do that. But you're suppressing the symptom. And if your dog lives with chronic stress, and this is important to tell people, that it can actually cause problems. Dogs can get gastric ulcers, just like people can. Dogs can um, have suppressed immune systems. They can have atrophy of the lymphatic glands. And you know what, if your immune system is suppressed, you know, it's just like in people. It opens the door for all kinds of disease. So I think it's very important for people to understand that, that it's more, more than just solving the problem. It's solving the underlying condition. Okay. Any questions before I go on? You are a quiet bunch of people. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm just so entertaining. I'll just blah, blah, blah. Feel free to jump in any time. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you a video, actually. Where's my roadie? <laughs> I have a roadie. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you a video, and this is a dog named Pigeon. This is actually courtesy of a trainer named Kiki Yablon. And Pigeon is a, five, is a uh, six-year-old female German Shepherd mix. Oh, Kiki, there you are! Yay! See, I always give you credit. Um, and, and, Kiki, and, and you can correct me if any of this is wrong, because uh, Pigeon is a six-year-old female German Shepherd mix and begins whining and following the owner around at departure cues then often goes voluntarily into the room and gets on the bed to take a stuffed Kong. But a minute or two after we leave and she finishes the Kong, which actually I think that's a problem because it should take longer than a minute or two, but uh, she begins to pant, pace, stand by the door, look out the window, very typical, right, and vocalize. Sometimes she also eliminates, usually within a minute or two of the departure. So let me just show you the clip. And hopefully you can see this okay. That's just a radio that's on, by the way. By the way, I think this is a great idea to have the mirror on the door if you're videotaping so you can see the rest of the room. And also that bag that's hanging on the door, it's not there to be some kind of a signal to the, to the dog or anything. Some people talk about doing that. It, it just happens to be there. Yeah, she's gone. 
And in fact, where the dog is now, she can see out the window to where the owner took off. So very typical pacing, going from exit point to where you can see where the owner left. Kind of mild whining intermittently. And by the way, I think it's important if you're going to look at video of what's going on that a trainer or somebody actually looks at it and assesses it rather than, you know, the owner saying, okay, this is what happened, I videotaped it. Why? Anybody? Any guesses? Yeah. Yeah, good point. Owners don't always pick up the cues. Anything else? They, make, they may make an assumption about something. And I can tell you also, you'll think it's a lot worse if you're the owner. You'll be going, it was terrible. She did this and she did, I know, I was that owner. <laughs> okay, so, so I just wanted to give you sort of just a baseline for what I would consider sort of mild, you know, mild to moderate. This is not severe by any means. Um, but the dog went back to the Kong Right? The, the, you know, I'm saying this is not true that a dog absolutely will not eat. And I'm going to show you other videos where you'll see that the dog is absolutely whining, barking, whatever, going back to the Kong or whatever they left for a little bit, going back to their display, and then going back to the food. So it's not that they won't eat. Um, and yes, a Kong should actually last, you know, obviously more than a minute or two. Um, I'm all about stuffing Kongs with all kinds of great stuff and getting dogs used to them, obviously, first. I love freezing things in a Kong because it lasts a lot longer. And so again, um, to gauge whether separation anxiety really is mild, moderate, or severe, I mean, obviously, yes, we know when it's severe. It's like really obvious, you can't miss it. But you can see basically how long did the symptoms persist Right? If this dog was to do this whining and pacing and then settle down and relax maybe and chew the Kong for a while, you know, that, that gives us a good gauge, right? Rather than, okay, she did this and she kept it up for an hour, you know? And do the symptoms get worse? Is it escalating? And also, does it happen every time you've left? Okay, so how long does it go on? And how intense is it? Because this, again, I would say mild to moderate, you know, not, not terrible. Again, that doesn't mean it's not a problem. You know, I'm not downplaying it. This is definitely a problem because the dog is stressed. Any questions or comments on this? Kiki, any? No? <laughs> I know, I'm putting you on the spot now. Since this was your... Okay, this was, oh yeah, this was a few years ago and since they had the assistance of a fabulous trainer, is, you know, obviously. Okay, so I, I want to talk about possible causes of separation issues. And the fact is, I mean, when you get a, a dog, you really are not going to know a lot of the time, especially if, you know, you've adopted a shelter dog like I did or, or you know, who knows. But let's talk about why this might happen. Um, it's interesting. You know, genetics really can play a part in separation issues, and I think this is something that gets kind of overlooked. There was a study that was done in 2001 by Cornell University Animal Behavior Clinic by a guy named Takuchi, and they found that of all of the purebred dogs who were in this study, uh, who were affected by separation anxiety, they were most likely to be gun dogs. Anybody have an idea why? You sound like a lady who knows. She says they're hyper hypersensitive to their environment and everything. <laughs> what kind of dog do you have? A Weimaraner. A Weimaraner. Well, yeah, they're kind of a category on their own, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, two and they both had separation anxiety. Yeah, extreme. So anybody know why, other than that they're, they can be very sensitive? What else about gun dogs? Okay, so what are they bred for? To work with people, right? If you think about a lot of the working dogs, the ones that are bred to work with people, they're going to be a lot different than a dog who's like, let's say, a livestock dog. Have you ever heard of an Anatolian Shepherd who had separation anxiety? <laughs> really? I haven't. They're like, yeah, we've got the sheep. It's good. You can go. You know? They don't care. Uh, dogs like beagles are bred to hunt like in packs, right? So they're, they're kind of pack animals. And yeah, a lot of them have separation issues as well. Um, so here in this study, uh, let's see, also, com yeah, companion dogs. Uh, um, and, and there was another study done in 2001 by Flanagan. And uh, you guys are familiar with Nicholas Dodman? 
he's a behaviorist who, who's involved in a lot of these studies. He, they looked at factors that were predictive of separation anxiety. They had 200 dogs with separation anxiety. They found that of the 131 purebreds, again, always purebreds are used for these studies, the majority were German shepherds, <laughs> my breed before the northern breeds, followed by a significant number of Labradors, Golden Retrievers, English Springer Spaniels, and English Cocker Spaniels. So not all of these are gun dogs, but they're all working dogs. They're all bred to work with people. So it's really not that surprising. Again, you know, if you have a companion dog, like a Bichon, a lot more likely to have separation issues than, again, your Anatolian Shepherd or your Livestock Guardian breeds. Makes sense, right? So in addition to genetics, we have assimilation issues. And what happens is, let's see, it's summer vacation, the kids are off school, right, for a couple months, and maybe the family takes a vacation for a week or two, and we bring a dog home. And everybody's loving on the dog and spending time with the dog, and isn't the dog cute? And then the vacation's over. And the party's over for the dog too, right? Because everybody's gone suddenly, so this is a problem. That dog might never have had a separation issue before, but now there's been a created one. So obviously that's why it's so important to tell people when they bring a new dog home to purposely start leaving the dog alone for short periods, even just, you know, gated behind something when you're in another part of the house. Because if that doesn't dog doesn't learn how to deal with even that separation, what's he going to do when you leave? Right? So start doing short separations, building up to longer ones. Um, a lot of times it's not even that, you know, there's a vacation. Sometimes it's circumstantial. You know, a lot of times people have been laid off work, you know, and they can't help it. And they're home for like three months and then they go back to work. Or somebody's got an illness and they're home for a long time and then they get better and they go out. And now the dog again, same effect, right? He, he's left alone. So we can also have um, a traumatic incident and... A traumatic incident can be anything. You know, it can be the loss of another dog in the family, and now this dog is suddenly left alone when the people are gone. It can be the loss of a human that the dog was really attached to. Or it can be something freakish. Um, I, don't know how, I don't know how many of you have read my book. I'm so good at marketing myself. My book. Uh, it's called Don't Leave Me, and that's Sierra on the cover. But for this book, I actually wanted to include stories from people whose dogs had separation anxiety. And I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but I want to read you part of Morgan's story. This, um, these are dogs that belong to Helen Hollander, who's a fabulous trainer. And this is what happened to Helen. Her, um, her and her husband had a great Dane that they just loved, named Mogul. And Mogul passed away. Morgan, who's their three-year-old Airedale, of course, you know, pined away for, for days over the absence of Morgan. But because Helen was home with her baby, you know, the dog had plenty of companionship and it was fine. So everything was fine. Dog did not have any separation issues at all. One day she went to visit her mom with Morgan. I, yeah, with Morgan. And here, I'm just going to read this. As soon as I entered her home, a man jumped out from around a corner of the entry hall and put a knife to my throat. Morgan began to growl. That's when the man took the knife away from my throat and dug it into Morgan's throat. He told me to shut the dog up or else. I immediately told the robber I'd give him whatever he wanted and pleaded with him not to hurt my dog. I told Morgan to hush, and he did. This is why training's important. <laughs> and he did, although I knew he could sense my tremendous fear and anxiety. The robber instructed me to give him money. I did, and he fled, leaving both of our lives traumatically changed in the wake. Morgan had always been fine if left with a sitter, but whenever he was all by himself, he showed destructive tendencies. Although my own fear and anxiety diminished over time, Morgan was out of control. The destructive behavior escalated. He began chewing pillows, he dug holes in the carpet, he ate through the baseboards of the wall, and threw the wall to the studs. And he managed to chew through a metal crate, inflicting severe wounds on his body. We no longer used a crate after that. Okay. Ultimately, we, we returned home from an early dinner to find Morgan sitting outside on our doorstep. <laughs> How could that be? While we were out, Morgan had managed the great escape. He literally dove through a glass window and screen, most probably in search of us. I then realized this dog was suffering from se severe separation anxiety. And this was way, way long ago before she was a trainer, by the way. Uh, whether it was triggered by the loss of his soulmate, the robbery, or, or a combination, he was suffering. Um, so she realized that he needed help, and basically, 
<laughs> she says, one day, don't ask me what I was thinking, I brought home a Wheaton Terrier puppy. Morgan was smitten with Bogey. Being the gentle dog that he was, he would follow the puppy around endlessly and sleep beside his crate as if he was the appointed puppy nanny. The two dogs became inseparable and my life slowly became less stressful. Was that what he needed? As a professional trainer these days, this would not be my first suggestion. However, for Morgan's insecurity, I have to answer yes. Morgan needed a stable mate. So, again, we have a dog who really didn't have a problem before, but something freakish and, and awful happened. And it doesn't have to be, obviously, this situation. It can be anything. It can be that the dog is, you know, has a traumatic attack from another dog. And is, you know how it is when people are sick and they're really needy, right? Same thing with dogs. And if the dog is suddenly insecure and needy, guess what? You can have a separation issue. And by the way, the issue of whether a second dog will help or not, we're going to talk about. So if you're thinking, yeah, what about that? <laughs> we're going to get to that. Any questions? Okay, good. So another thing that can happen is that with aging and with illness, dogs and people tend to get more clingy and needy, you know? So it can be something as simple as, you know, a dog has a loss of hearing, which makes him feel like he can't navigate um, his environment or hear things coming, or loss of eyesight, and all of a sudden he's kind of just not as confident as he was before, and he feels better when there's somebody around that he can follow around, that's kind of like his anchor, you know? Another um, thing is, obviously if a dog is a senior, he should be checked. Anytime a senior dog has like sudden separation issues, the first thing is they go right to the vet. You know, they, I want blood work, I want to see what's going on, because very often there can be something. There can also be cognitive decline, you know, with senior dogs, and that can manifest actually as separation anxiety. So that's very often um, important to rule out. If it is cognitive dysfunction, there are things that can be done, by the way. It doesn't mean the dog has to just keep getting worse. There's nutritional intervention and supplements, um, and anxiety meds may be um, called for as well. There was also a really interesting article. Uh, I don't know how many of you are APDT members. Yeah? Okay, so some. Uh, in the Chronicle of the Dog, the magazine of the organization, there was an article, I don't know if you saw it, where Nicholas Dodman was discussing nocturnal separation anxiety. And I found this really fascinating. And what he was talking about is dogs who seem okay for the most part during the day, but then at night, they're really, really clingy. And that's when their separation anxiety comes out. And people are always saying, well, that's weird. He's fine during the day. Why would it suddenly, is he afraid of the dark? I mean, you know, why would he suddenly have that? Well, you know why? Because the dogs have some kind of an underlying illness. And you know if you've ever had any kind of an illness or even just having a flu or something, during the day, you're doing your stuff. You're out there. You're not thinking about, oh, I'm sick, I'm not feeling well, right? You're out there doing what you have to do. At night, when there's nothing else to distract you, you're like, oh, I feel like crap, <laughs> right? And the dog is doing the same thing. So Nick Dodman talks about nocturnal separation anxiety, where there are no signs of cognitive decline, right? They've ruled that out. But the dog is hypervigilant and anxious at night. And he states that in all the cases he's encountered, once cognitive dysfunction and noise phobias were ruled out, a painful medical condition that had not been obvious was discovered. Some of these included tumors of the brain, bone, bladder, or eye, and severe spinal arthritis. Okay. So again, really important to keep in mind and rule out, because if it is something like that, all your behavior modification is not going to do anything. Okay. So it may be the medical uh, condition needs to be treated. Any questions before I move on? Okay. So I want to show you a uh, video of a, this was an actual client of mine. And about the separation issue that you mentioned. Yeah, he used to be so fine when I left him, but as he got attached to me more and more, because I spent a lot of time with him, so mm -hmm. I feel like he's getting closer to me and much more attached to me. So it's getting hard for him to be by himself. Okay, and he's how old now? He is uh, 17, almost 18, 18 weeks. Okay. 17. And what is your daily schedule like? Are you at uh, home all the time? I'm or? home, yeah, four or five days a week. Okay. Yeah. And so then the I, other days? And then the only one, two days that I have to leave him for like uh, seven, eight hours. And you know what? Even when I have to go upstairs for, to get ready for work, it, it's just feel, it feels secure only in this floor. Sometimes I just take him with me right. and he's freeze. he freezes. 
because he doesn't know the, the area, so he's scared. He, he get panic. Okay. And, and what do you do when that happens? He's crying because I want to. So he's crying even though he's with you upstairs with me, because yeah. he's nervous. He's nervous. He doesn't okay. know this floor because he's usually here and he feels okay. very secure and safe here. Right. So he doesn't know upstairs, so he get panic and nervous. Okay. And what does he do when he gets panicked and nervous? Uh he's one crying, and then I put him on the floor. He's like running, trying to escape, and doesn't know where to go. He's okay. so. Penny. And then what do you do when he does that? So I understand and he, feel, he doesn't feel well, so I take him down. Okay. I don't want to close him because I'm here, but, you know, so I leave him free on this floor and I go upstairs, but then he's waiting for me. He's waiting and waiting. It has like, he has like five minutes limit. <laughs> okay. After five minutes he will start to cry and bark and do the <laughs> Okay, so you're saying that he can be downstairs by himself if he's loose for up to about five minutes? Yeah. And then he starts whining and, and crying, yeah. and then what happens? And then I have to go downstairs. And I just, even if I close him in, this, in his area, so he'll, he'll cry. Cause you know I'm here. So he doesn't like to be free by himself, and he doesn't like to be clothed by himself. He just wants to be with me. Okay. So... <laughs> Comments? Questions? Anybody? She, oh, she said the age was, was it 15 to 18 or, or 18 months? M months? No, weeks. Weeks. Yeah, weeks. I, it was hard to hear. It was, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it, it's a small breed anyway, but yeah. Who has the problem here, do you think? Yeah, did you notice anything about what was going on physically? Oh, yeah. Anybody notice when the dog tried to, like, get away off the couch? <laughs> he really needs me. Yeah. She said, yeah, the question is, did she, any, did she say anything that indicated she was reinforcing the behavior? I think everything that came out of her mouth pretty much indicated that she was reinforcing. Yeah, and this is a nice lady, you know, who loves her dog. But, you know, the dog didn't seem really too worried about her. Did anybody notice when she made that little, mm -hmm, you know, kind of... How many of you, if, you're, if you did that, would your dogs go, what's wrong? Her dog didn't bat an eyelash. Her dog was like, I'm busy here. Okay, I'll get back to you later. Take a message. So yeah, to me, this dog really doesn't actually have a separation issue as much as, as maybe she might think. However, she does say that when she goes upstairs, you know, after five minutes, right, the dog starts whining, and I believe her, you know, so the dog doesn't like to be left by himself, maybe. But I'll tell you what we did. We went upstairs. And yeah, I was like, is the dog going to burst into flames? What's going to happen, you know? So, so, I mean, it was hard because she's the owner and there's an emotional attachment and I understand that. But, but, you know, we went upstairs and it was hard for her. And the dog did, you know, whine and bark as promised, but, and it did escalate and we had sort of that big extinction burst, right, of, wah, you know, where are you? Why isn't this working? It always worked before. It always brought you back. Hello. You know, but she didn't come back. And the dog calmed down. And it was a beautiful thing. And you can't really just tell somebody that just wait it out, because it's very hard for people to do that. If, if you can do it with them, you know, if you're a trainer, then, then all the better, because they have to really see that, that it's real, that the dog really can calm down. So a lot of times it's really that the owner has sort of a maybe overblown perception of how bad the problem is, you know? Other times the owner has have a perfect perception of exactly what the problem is, and, and you know, they're right on. But in this case, I think that, that the owner was part of the problem. So... Let's talk about some things that we can do, right? Some, some solutions here. And the first thing is we want the dog to be as calm across the board as possible. If you think about it, if you have anxiety in certain situations, let's say you're anxious when you walk into a room full of people, right? Well, actually, here, let's say that you're, you're ang I'm obviously not anxious <laughs> talking up here, but let's just say you're like, oh my God, I have to get up in front of a room full of people. So would it be better for me to do this after like, I don't know, five cups of coffee and no exercise? Or would it be better for me to, I don't know, go like work out somewhere maybe, or, you know, eat like a nice balanced meal and then come in and do it? 
you know, think about it, right? But th- what I'm getting t- at is you want your dog to be as relaxed as possible before the person leaves for the day, right? And and in general in their life. So to do that, and I'm not going to kind of go way into this, but nutrition, obviously we want the dog on a good balanced diet, not something that has a lot of high corn, not something that has a lot of byproducts and crap in it, because then the dog's nervous system, you know that... Um, serotonin is the neurotransmitter in the brain that is responsible for quite a few things actually but one of them is the regulation of mood and it keeps us kind of nice and calm well if you have a food that has a lot of corn in it corn is actually sort of the anti-tryptophan it kind of lowers the levels of tryptophan and tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin if you want to know more about this go read uh, James O'Hare has a book about canine neurochemistry and he'll go into all the depth about it, and he's, he's the expert, I'm not. But I will tell you that for sure, if you take a dog who's on a really crappy kibble with lots of corn and byproducts and that kind of thing, and you do nothing behaviorally, you just switch the dog's food to something much healthier, I'm telling you that within probably three weeks, you'll see a difference in behavior. Whether it was that the dog was aggressive, whether it was that the dog was hyperactive, whether the dog was fearful and had, you know, separation issues, you will see some kind of an improvement and a change. It'll actually just, like, really take the edge off. And, you know, a lot of people just sort of jump to drugs right away. They don't think about nutrition. Nutrition is, like, one of the best sort of drugs, you know, one of the best treatments that the body can have. So we want to make sure that the dog is on a good good diet. Any questions on that before I move on? Yes, ma'am. Right. Good question. So her question is, if, what, if, what if you start transferring them to another food, how long would it take to see results? And I want to mention, and thank you for bringing this up, that when you do transfer, I know we all know this, but I'm going to just put it out there, you want to do it gradually, add a little of the new food, and you know, because I don't want somebody to watch this DVD because they're filming and say, Nicole told me to switch the food and now my dog has really bad diarrhea. <laughs> okay? gradually. <laughs> um, but I would say that once the dog is completely on the new food, I would probably give it about three weeks before you really start to say, you know, look, he's been on this new food for a whole week. Why aren't I seeing anything? You know, and that's just obviously every dog's neurochemistry is different and, and biochemistry, but I would say as a general, yeah. Ah, good question. Excellent question. Okay, great question. So her question is, what do you do when the vet says, well, you know, or, or the, the person says, well, my vet put this dog on a, and we all know what kind of food this is, but I'm not going to say it, on a prescription diet, uh, which is a kibble. And um, here's what I say. You know, I would never disagree with your vet because that's not my place, right? I'm, I'm just a dog trainer, behavior person, but let me just give you the facts. These are the indisputable facts. And then I will give them, and I'll, I'll just tell you really quickly. This is my nutrition spiel. I'll say, you know what? There are three grades of meat. You basically want the first two ingredients in your dog's food, and most people are feeding kibble. So let's just say in a kibble. They have to, by law, be, is, be listed on the bag in the order of what there's the most of first, and then it goes down by bulk weight. That's the law. So you want to see the first two ingredients have something to do with meat. If you're using, let's say, a chicken-based food as an example, chicken with nothing after it, that would be a whole meat source. Chicken meal is the next one down, rendered muscle tissue and so forth. Not bad. It's okay if you have chicken and then chicken meal, that's okay. What you really don't want to see is byproducts. Byproducts in a chicken would be things like the feet, the beaks, the heads, the undeveloped eggs, the intestines. Yeah, things that should make you go, ew. So I tell them all of this, and then I say you also don't want to see corn because corn is, number one, it's a real allergen for a lot of dogs. A lot of dogs have dry, itchy skin, hot spots, and I very seldom hear people say, yeah, my vet asked me about the diet, you know, but, but that is very responsible a lot of the time. And again, the whole thing about the serotonin, you know, and, and I'll tell them that, and then I'll say, well, let's go look at your dog's food, and we look at the bag together. And it may be that it doesn't have that, but if it does, it's like, oh yeah, you told me about this, and look, there's the byproducts, there's the corn. So again, I just give them the facts, you know. And I might, I would definitely suggest, you know, you know, it's up to you. This is what your vet told you. 
you know, if it was my dog, but obviously if the dog is on it for a medical condition, I would never dispute anything to do with that. I would still give them the information. Uh, my own dogs are on, um, I feed raw. I had wolves for 10 years. I mean, not because I thought, oh, they would be great pets, but because, you know, I worked in rescue and you know how that goes. And you bring the dogs home and fostering, better known as adoption. Um, so, <laughs> only they were wolves. So uh, they were obviously raw fed, and, and I went on to raw feeding my dogs, and because I'm just the kind of person who's not going to sit there and grind stuff up for hours and balance and measure, because I'm just not, um, I actually order from a company called Darwin's. Do you have any? I love Darwin's. It's great. They deliver it to my door, and it comes in like little packets, and I open them and stick them in the dish, and it's balanced, and I'm done. And then, by the way, I stick their second meal in a Kong so they can get that, you know, a little bit more stuff to do during the day. So, yes. Oh, the person who, who wrote the book is James O'Hare. It's O apostrophe H-E-A-R-E. -E. First name, James. And it's canine neurochemistry? Yeah, yeah you'll see it. If, if you Google him or, like on, or on Amazon, you'll find it. Who's the question? Yeah. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. There are a couple of different sites. Do you, is it doggy, dog, doggyfood.com? Dog food analysis, it's something like that, dogfoodanalysis.com? Yeah, there's a few sites like that where if you know the name of the food, they'll actually list the ingredients. So, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Ah, good question. Yeah, so she's saying that, you know, she's been told avoid it if corn is in the first four ingredients. Here's what sneaky manufacturers do a lot of the time. They take an ingredient like corn, and because it's listed in order of bulk weight, they'll actually break it down into its components. So you'll see things like whole grain sorghum, you know, and corn meal, and this and that. And because if they put it as one ingredient, it would weigh more and it would have to be listed higher. I advise foods that don't have any corn in it. I mean, it is a protein, but, you know, not that digestible as we know. I would prefer personally, uh, you know, I'm not a vet, obviously, but yeah. And raw foods are usually, they're not going to have corn in them either. Yeah. Other questions about the nutrition before I move on? No? Okay, good. Good questions, you guys. Yes. Good point. So, but, but yeah, so she's saying it's hard to find in the commercial foods because a lot of times the animals are corn, or corn fed. I know. That's all I can say is, I mean, you... Yes, and there are, there are a lot more grain-free kibbles out there now, completely. So, I mean, Evo is one. I mean, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, if you do your research. And you know the Whole Dog Journal? Do you guys get that? The Whole Dog Journal, and that's W-H-O-L-E, is a fantastic source of really good um, uh, articles about, you know, they do every year kind of like what's the new foods and what's the best foods and so forth. And they'll do ratings. They'll do ratings and say, you know, what kibble is actually the highest rated, what ingredients do they have in them, and so forth. So that's a good question. There have been a lot of recalls for different kibbles. And yeah, the question is, do you automatically say, you know, that's it, get off that food? I think it depends how the manufacturer handles it. Because, I mean, stuff can happen with pretty much anything, you know, that, and some things are out of their control. I think it really depends a lot on how they handle it. A lot of those manufacturers, the really good ones, they'll send out an email to everybody. They'll blast, you know, on the news and they'll say, we found this, but, you know, it was only in these batches and we're taking care of it and these are the steps we're taking. So for that, I, I wouldn't switch personally. But if it's something like, you know, there's something that's been really wrong and dogs are dying everywhere and they're not doing anything about it, yeah, get the dog off that food. So, yeah. Yeah, there's been a problem with some ingredients coming from China with a lot of foods. I personally would like to have something that was sourced a lot closer to home, you know? Yeah. I mean, why take a chance, you know? Yeah. Plus, you're supporting American industry, you know? Yeah. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. So, exercise. Obviously, we all know dogs need exercise, right? But here's the thing. Dogs who are stressed or anxious really need exercise. And I want to make sure that they get it in general, but also I think, and I know, that it's very important for a dog who has separation issues to be well exercised before the person leaves. Okay? Now, I've had somebody disagree with me on this, but I'm telling you from my very own experience living with a dog like this, Sierra 
is a lot better, right? When, I mean, her issues are better now, just so you know. I mean, we worked on this. But when she had these issues, she was a lot better when she was well exercised. There was a real difference. You could tell the difference. So, you know, we want to make sure that the dog is tired, but I would suggest things like a long walk or a hike, not let's throw the ball for a half hour and now the dog's all hyped up and then you walk out the door and the adrenaline's still way up here because then it has to go somewhere and it's going to go into things like destruction, right? So I want to, you know, if you have no other choice, but okay, I can't really go out and walk for whatever reason, you know, do your ball throwing, do whatever you do, but make sure that those adrenaline levels are back down, which I would say happens in maybe 15, 20 minutes. You know, give the dog at least half an hour before you walk out the door. And if you can't go anywhere, you can still do things like a training session that are mentally stimulating, which can tire a dog out. You know, <laughs> it's funny because we're in the math building, right? So which tires you guys out more? Doing like a half hour of calculus. I said the C word. Calculus or balancing your checkbook or something like that, you know, or taking a walk. I mean, I, the mental stimulation is a lot more tiring a lot of the time. So doing things like clicker training, you know, or mentally stimulating as well. Um, we all know about things like stuffing Kongs, you know, and, and having things that you can put kibble in and roll it, the dog rolls it around and so forth. And so those are really mentally stimulating. And it is important also to give the dog those things before you leave. You don't only want to give the dog those things before you leave. Why? Anybody? Yeah, it's going to be a signal. Oh, God, no, not the Kong. That means she's leaving, right? So we want to do it at other times as well. But again, the empty Kong or, or the chewed bully stick or whatever it is is not necessarily an indication in and of itself that the dog was totally cool when you were gone because the dog might still be stressed. Um, confidence building. It's logical, right? The, do the dog is kind of insecure, anxious about being left alone. Now, there are dogs that are secure in other areas of their life that are just insecure about their people leaving. Uh, but there are many, many dogs who have separation issues that are insecure dogs in general. And it just makes sense. Build the dog's confidence. Why not? It's not going to hurt anything, and it certainly might help. So uh, ways to do that. Number one, keeping a routine. Because if the dog doesn't really know what's going to happen during the day, the dog's going to be stressed. Right? Now, when I say keeping a routine, I don't want you to keep too tight of a routine. And what I mean by that is, if you feed your dogs every single day at 3 o'clock on the dot, what's going to happen the day that you're not there to feed them at 3 o'clock? And the dog's going, you know, we have a really good sense of time. Hello, where are you? You're late. It's like 3.30. You know? And so now the dog has something else to be stressed about. So I personally suggest varying a dog's feeding time. I mean, not by five hours, but, you know, an hour, a half hour here and there, which is natural. We all kind of do that anyway. We come home, you know, different times. So, so definitely varying that as well. Training, especially things like clicker training that teach dogs to think for themselves and offer behaviors are great. And it doesn't have to be obedience. It could be tricks. It could be anything. Just something that will build the dog's confidence. Um, dog sports, you know, things like agility are great for confidence building. And it, it doesn't have to be that. Um, you know, we do urban mushing with our dogs. You know, I'm in Southern California, so there's not like a hell of a lot of snow. Uh, do you have to? Okay, urban mushing. We love that. If you want to learn more, it's urbanmushing.com. Now, I have northern breeds, but you don't have to have northern breeds. You can, I mean, I know people that do this with, you know, just every kind of breed and smaller dogs, too. Um, and basically, what they're doing is there's a person on a scooter, and they're harnessed like they would be on a sled. It's great. It's really fun. A little scary when you're on the scooter and you have two, you know, northern breeds, but... Uh, it, it is really a cool sport, and, and it doesn't have to be that sort of exciting. You know, they can do tracking, um, and tracking has a lot of mental stimulation. Canine nose work, which I think is a wonderful sport. And the really cool thing about canine nose work, too, is that the dog doesn't have to be like a young athletic dog. Older dogs can do it. Dogs who have physical issues can do it, you know? And people that have physical issues, because, you know, agility, you've got to be out there running with the dog. You know, so here it is, canine nose work, really mentally stimulating and really, really good for confidence building. Let's talk about the fun subject of, I've got a dog with separation anxiety, what the heck do I do with this dog when I want to go out and have a life? Better known as management. <laughs> yeah, this is the tricky part, and this is the part that wears people down over time, and they say, I can't deal with this dog anymore, and I can honestly say that as an owner. <laughs> now, 
I'm going to tell you, I, as an owner, I really did the behavior modification protocols, you know, obviously being a behavior person also, and everything else. But uh, I would say that I did six weeks straight a very heavy duty behavior mod where Sierra was not left by herself at all, ever. Except, okay, I had an incident in the middle of the night where I ended up getting rushed to the hospital, okay? So, you want to know, this is really funny, actually. Um, here, here's how I react to stress. So I have, I have a little heart issue, you know, this is not a big deal. But I'm kind of used to little things happening. And it's, it's not anything life-threatening, and it's fine. So in the middle of the night, walking from the bathroom, for, from the bedroom to the bathroom, you know, um, I, I started having like a feeling like, you know, the hand squeezing your heart, which is never good. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to stand here and breathe and it's going to stop in a minute. It's happened before. So it didn't stop. And then my hands got tingly. And then I started not being able to breathe. And I thought, you know, <laughs> this seems suspiciously like what I've heard things like a heart attack could be like. So I sat down and I Googled heart attacks. <laughs> Heart attacks, women's symptoms, and a bunch comes up, actually. And so I'm sitting there, and it's, there's a checklist, and I'm going, check, check, check. And then at the bottom, it says, if you have any of these symptoms, get off the computer and go call 911. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, I should. And mind you, I haven't wake, woke my husband up, you know. So I just go, and I call 911, and I go, you know, this is probably, I really probably shouldn't even be calling you, but here's what's happening. And she's like, ma'am. Go sit down immediately, ma'am, and there will be paramedics at your house momentarily. So, you know, they, paramedics get there, and they, you know, hook you up to monitors, and they do all kinds of stuff, and they're like, you have to go to the hospital. And I'm going, but my dog has separation anxiety. <laughs> I can't leave her. Ma'am, you need to go to the hospital. Five weeks of behavior mod down the drain, ma'am. Okay, so, yeah, I went, you know, so, and, and I was fine, but <laughs> it was kind of, um, kind of funny, I thought. <laughs> So anyway, my point is, I was really strict about this behavior mod thing, right? And um, I will say that after six weeks, and, and I did not put her on any kind of medication or anything, I just did, you know, behavior mod. After six weeks of this, I looked at my husband and I said, one of us has to be on drugs. <laughs> and I think maybe both. <laughs> but yeah, so we did end up putting her on something which I will talk about. But here's the deal, management, you're going to give up stuff that you want to do. It's just inevitable. Now, you have to have a life, and you have to go out and do your errands and, you know, go to a doctor's appointment or, or whatever you have to do. But the idea is that we don't want as much as possible, barring, you know, the heart incident in the middle of the night, we don't want the dog to be left alone if we can help it during this process. Because what does it do? I mean, it just sets you back to square one. You can't go work a day job during the day and then come home at night. You know, I had somebody write a review of my book on, on Amazon, and he was very angry. He said, she doesn't tell you anything about what if you work during the day and then you want to just, you know, practice the protocol at night. <laughs> like, you can't practice the protocol just, that's like saying my dog is aggressive and I'm going to have him around other dogs all the time and then, you know, at night I'm going to work on the protocol. You can't. It has to be, you know, it's a lifestyle change. So, what that said, it's not that easy, right, to do that. It's easier said than done. And owners will feel trapped, you know, which I can tell you. So you're, you're turning down social engagements. You're turning down things that you really do want to do. Um, I think that telling people that everything you're doing now, all of this, while it is stressful, will actually lower your dog's stress in the long run and is helping to work towards lowering your stress in the long run as well. That's really kind of important for people to know. So... Barring super hot weather, obviously you can bring your dog along for short errands. And the interesting thing is that a lot of dogs actually do better in a vehicle than they will when you're gone from the house. Why? Anybody? Because what? Your scent. Okay, your scent's in the vehicle. That's a good point. And also, yeah, you always come back pretty quick. I mean, unless you're like you know really shopping for jeans or something, and you're a woman. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> You're always back pretty quickly. Um, and the dog knows that. And I suggest that if you do take your dog for errands, you park where the dog can easily see you. You know, and I used to do that because I'm at the post office kind of all the time. And I would park right there in the shade where my dogs could see me or where Sierra could see me. Um, so bringing along if you can. Uh, also, by the way, and we will talk a little bit later about the thunder shirts and body wraps, but this is something where I would say maybe a thunder shirt or a body wrap would be helpful for the dog in the car with you to do errands. And obviously not only 
to do errands, but at other times as well and pair it with happy things so it's not just a signal that you're going away. Getting a pet sitter is great if you can afford one. And I'm not saying for the dog 24-7. I mean for that time where you really have to go and do something. And again, that's going to work if the dog has isolation distress, not, oh my god, it's that one person. Um, isolation distress, obviously you have a lot more options. So if you can't sort of afford the pet sitter or you don't have one that you know, if you have a friend, if you have a relative, you know, that you can drop the dog off for short periods. I had a woman who had a uh, wolf dog who was a training client of mine and she would work during the day and the wolf dog had a sort of separation issue and she would drop her off at her mom's house, you know, during the day and she would <laughs> wolf sit, <laughs> you know, so that worked. Um, and, you know, doggy daycare is another option. And, you know, it's interesting because doggy daycare is great, obviously, for a dog who just doesn't like being alone. But, and it has to be a dog-friendly dog, of course. But I think that also in a lot of cases, even if the dog has like a mild to moderate separation anxiety from a particular person, if that dog really loves playing with other dogs, a lot of times it's like, wow, even though he's got that issue, he's okay at doggy daycare. You know, it's kind of like the kid who's like maybe worried that he's separated from you, but you send him to Disneyland, and he's kind of like, woohoo, it's great. Oh yeah, come back later, mom, you know, I'm going on the ride. So, so it can be really a good solution for that as well. And I'm not saying that you have to be able to afford this stuff every day, because a lot of people can't, that's the, you know, the reality of it. But you can arrange things like play dates with another person's dog, um, you know, at their house or at your house. Obviously you want to take into account the safety of the area, you know, pools, fencing, things like that, are they going to be destructive and so forth. But if you can arrange that, and the idea is that, you know, you sit down and you have a schedule where you go, okay, I'm gone Monday through Friday, I'm working a regular job, what can I arrange? Here's what I do, you know, and in the book I actually show, you know, examples of this. Here's what we do Monday, my neighbor can watch the dog. Here's what we do Tuesday, doggy daycare, Here, you know, and so forth. And obviously you modify it as you have to go. Um, you can also take your dog along on things like, you know, Starbucks. You can sit outside with your dog at Starbucks. There are, I'm sure, cafes out here where, where you can take your dog and kind of sit. Um, Aaron's places like Home Depot, at least by us, you're allowed to take your dog into the store here as well. Yeah. So, you know, places like that. Um, and this is going to reduce the stress for everybody. Now, there are going to be times where you just can't do any of that and you've got an emergency and it's like, wow, so-and-so who normally I would drop the dog off, I can't, but I've got a doctor's appointment and I'm going to be gone maybe like two, three hours. So what am I going to do? Here's what I think. <laughs> Save up your dog's grooming for when you have an emergency. <laughs> and I'm serious because, I mean, granted, your groomer is not a babysitter for your dog, but... If you've got a dog that you take to the groomer every, you know, whatever, six weeks or whatever it is, save it for when you have an emergency or you just want to go to lunch and have a life, okay? Because you know a groomer, I mean, depending on what kind of dog you have, he's going to be there probably two, three hours. They're waiting, there's other dogs, then the drying, you know, things take a while. Now, go and pick your dog up when you're supposed to. I mean, don't just leave him there, obviously. I'm not suggesting that you do that. But I think that that's a really great solution. Um, there's also day boarding at a lot of vet offices, but again, it's, it depends on the dog and whether he's okay being crated and so forth. Now, we're going to talk about being sneaky, <laughs> and this is another thing if there's an emergency, okay, I'm not saying do this all the time, but if you have a dog who is okay with you being out of their sight in the house, so for example, if you gate your dog off in the bedroom, you can be in other parts of the house and that dog's okay as long as he knows that you're somewhere in the house, right? He hears you, you know, doing dishes or whatever you're doing. Then you can fake him out. You can actually make like a little endless loop, you know, to put on a, on a CD of house sounds, okay? And you want to make this as natural as possible. I'm in the living room now, you know, you don't need to do that. But whatever you would normally do, you know, talking on the phone or, you know, running the vacuum or, you know, whatever, as long as that doesn't freak them out, whatever you would normally do. And try to make it like 30 minutes long, an hour, whatever you can do. So you have this thing set. Now, you're going to practice having the dog in what I would call the alone zone, the place that you want to keep your dog when he's gone, wh when you're gone. And this, w we will talk about where that should be. But let's say you got your dog in his alone zone and you're in another part of the house, and you can, you know, make these same noises, you can play this thing, I just want him to get used to it. 
Now comes the time when you have to go. So now the dogs say, you know, gated, there's the bedroom. I'm in another part of the house. I'm going to put this, this on at the level that the dog would normally hear it at. And basically, the, the part that's not so easy is, is getting out of the house. So if you're in an apartment, obviously, you're just going to, you know, close the door quietly and go down the hall, tiptoe down and get in the elevator, and the dog's not going to know it's you. If you have a house with the car parked right outside, you can tiptoe out and everything, but you know what? The dog's going to hear the car leave. So what you have to do is actually park just a short distance away the day before. I'm not kidding. Um, I actually live on a small hill, and so what I learned is that if you live on a small hill, you can actually put the car into neutral <laughs> and sort of roll down the hill and then start the car. And the dog won't know. <laughs> it's great. So I'm just saying, just if you absolutely have to do it, these, these are the, this is what happens when you have to get creative, guys, okay? And so take it for what it's worth. Um, I, I think that if you're a trainer, it's really, really important that you help your clients to write out the options. And if you're an owner doing this, you have to have a written plan. You know, it's great to say, okay, we'll do this. I think, okay, so you've told us this, we'll do that maybe a few days a week. You've got to have something in writing. And obviously, yes, because it organizes you. But also, I can tell you that having something written down that you can hold in your hand, that makes you feel so much better. It makes you feel like, wow, th this is solid. This is something that gives me hope. You know, something that we, now we have a plan, now we know what we're going to do. Okay. Anything, any questions before I move on? Okay. So let's talk about the alone zone. Where do we leave the dog? And this is an important thing because if you make the wrong decision on that, it can, it can go awry. Um, we mentioned crates earlier. And so let me just ask, how many of you think it's a good idea to leave a dog with separation anxiety? And don't worry, I'm not judging you here. You can say yes or no, because people have different opinions on this. How many of you think it's a, it's a good idea to create a dog who has separation issues? Okay. Yeah, so some. And how many of you think it's a bad idea to create a dog with separation issues? Okay, so a few more. And how many of you have another answer? It depends, yes, and I'd have to agree with that. It absolutely does depend on the dog, because you're both right. The thing is, it could be a good solution for some dogs, and for some dogs, it's absolutely the wrong solution, right? It really does depend. So the best form of containment is going to depend on the individual dog. It's going to depend on the level of separation anxiety. A crate, if you have a dog who's accustomed to a crate, he sleeps in his crate, he likes his crate, it's his happy place, you know, and it's a really kind of mild issue, it might be absolutely fine. And the nice thing about the crate is for those dogs who do that sort of pacing between the door, the door and the window and they kind of wind themselves up, the crate kind of prevents that. So the dog's kind of in one place and hopefully they just kind of relax because there's not much to do, you know. And, so, and you may have a Kong or whatever, but that's kind of about it. Um, I think that dogs do better in plastic crates in general, the kind of varicennal kinds that give them a, a closed-in feeling. If there's absolutely no other choice for some reason, you can always put a towel over a wire crate. However, a lot of dogs hurt themselves, you know, trying to get like a paw through on those metal bars. And um, this is just a, an example of what can happen if you have a wire crate and a dog really wants to get out. Yeah, so it's not like having a wire crate guarantees that they can't get out of it. Um, and a dog who really has a severe issue can really hurt themselves trying to get out of the crate or self-mutilating because there's nothing else for them to take that anxiety out on. Okay, was there a question? No? Okay. Um, you can also do a gated area. I really like this as a solution for a lot of dogs. Gated off area can be, and I don't mean like a tiny laundry room or you know, a bathroom or something. I, I really don't suggest you know, closing a dog in, in a bathroom. You know, even dogs who don't have separation anxiety, because you'll come back and there's that like toilet paper motif, you know, and you know, <laughs> redecorated while you were gone. Um, but, but the gated area is really nice. Some dogs actually, if they're not having potty accidents or being severely destructive or anything, some dogs actually do better in the owner's bedroom because your scent is on everything in there, you know, the bedding and so forth, and that's really comforting to the dogs. So putting a gate across that is nice. 
Um, you can have, you know, if the dog does have potty accidents, obviously kitchens are not normally carpeted. You may want to choose the kitchen for a gate. And a lot of people say, well, I would do that, but, you know, he'll, he'll jump over the gate. But, you know, you can stack baby gates on top of each other. And if the dog is actually climbing the gate, which is what happens a lot of the time, you can get those, um, like, wrought iron ones. And they have very tall ones now. I actually had to find one for a client of mine. The catalog in the company of dogs sells, I mean, they're not cheap, but they sell quite a selection. And that's where I finally found her one that was super high and, and fit her space that she had. Yeah. Ah, good question. What's the advantage of the gated area as opposed to free roaming the house? If you have a dog who's destructive when you're gone, it's a big advantage. Um, no, seriously, because... Yeah, they can't get to the door, they can't get to the window, they can't eat your couch, you know. And I say that as a person who's had a dog who's eaten a couch. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff they can't do. And, and if they have potty accidents when you're gone, at least it's confined to the kitchen, you know. And again, we want sort of a bigger area if possible. Uh, also with those gates, you, if you have nothing but a baby gate and that's kind of just what you have and you can't buy another one for whatever reason, you can attach something to the inside you know, either like a lucite panel or shade cloth or material, something so that the dog can't get purchase, you know, to, to climb over. Okay. The company was in the company of dogs. If you Google it, it'll come up. They have a catalog. I'm not sure if that's their website, just in the company of dogs.com. Yeah. And they, they've got a variety of, of options. They make a Basker, the Baskerville muzzle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they have a lot of nice products, actually. So another thing is, yes, now you were mentioning uh, what's the advantage and maybe what about leaving the dog loose. There are some dogs that actually do better when they're not confined. You know, I, I have known a few different cases where somebody tried to crate the dog. In fact, Tia had a case like that where, and, and she emailed me and said, you know, I don't know what to do. And we've really, you know, we've tried the crate. And her, you know, she's got crates because she used to have exotics at her place. So she had crates that would hold tigers, you know, and things like that. And she's like, so I loaned them the tiger crate, you know, and which is great, you know, because who has that? But the dog was still, you know, just wanting out. And I said, you know what? Don't use anything. The dog wasn't destructive, you know, but they thought it should be crated anyway. And I said, don't, don't use the crate. See what happens if the dog is left loose, you know, because he's not destructive. And you know what? It was fine. The dog wasn't stressed. So there are some dogs that, that will actually do better when they're roaming. Obviously, you don't want it, the dogs that will eat the couch, you don't want that to happen. And if you're not sure if it's a dog, that how would you know? Then you'll know when we talk about the monitoring things in live time, because I don't want to suggest that anybody's furniture gets destroyed. Um, some dogs actually do better in the backyard, you know, and if you have to be careful though about the fencing and, and because obviously if a dog has separation anxiety, just like Sierra, and, and they're like little Houdinis, you know, in fur, they can get over, like she could get over six foot fencing like it was nothing, you know. And a lot of times, by the way, I see this and I think it's worth mentioning, when I'll look at somebody's backyard, um, the fencing may be okay, but they'll have like those tall garbage cans and they're pushed up right against the fence. And so the dogs go bink, bink. It's very common, you know, so you really want to look at what's next to the fencing as well as the actual fencing. Yeah, years of dealing with wolf hybrids. Um, it may work to have a pulley run if you have a dog who has no other options. You know what I mean? The pulley runs that go like between the trees and, and the dog has like a harness thing on. I don't recommend them often, but I just think the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better. Um, but I do want to mention that some dogs actually have barrier frustration. And if you have a dog door, and let's say, you know, you put the thing down and you lock the dog outside, they'll spend the whole time that you're gone trying to get back into the house. If you lock them inside the house, they spend the whole time trying to get outside the house. And so sometimes it's better to actually just open the dog door. Um, I'm, I'm going to read you guys a story because I think this is really interesting. And this is a short one. This is uh, Amber Burkhalter, who uh, owns Canine Coach in Atlanta. This is a story of how they solve separation anxiety. Lauren had had recently adopted Harley, a handsome two-year-old beagle. I love that, a handsome two-year-old beagle. Uh, his history included several failed placements due to separation anxiety that manifested itself with severe destruction to the home, vomiting, and diarrhea and urinating both in and out of a crate when left alone. So this is a pretty severe case. I mean, the dog's vomiting when you're gone. Lauren was totally committed to Harley, but she was worried that he would never be safe when left alone. She was spending a fortune on daycare, 
and during the work week, and she felt trapped at home, you know, and on the weekends. So their training staff began a heavy behavior modification program that included obedience work, crate training, desensitization, reconditioning, use of holistic therapies, and these people know what they're doing, okay? So success was moderate at best. We decided after much discussion to introduce a daily SSRI medication to Harley in addition to the intensive behavior modification. His vet prescribed a popular SSRI and within three weeks, Harley had a sudden seizure as a result of the new medication and was immediately taken off it. Lauren did not want to try any others and was at her wit's end. I called a meeting with the training staff and Harley's primary trainer, Kat, suggested we try a dog door. I said, well, we have nothing else, you know, why not try it? Within one day of installing the dog door, all of Harley's symptoms were gone. He now lives medication-free, happily exploring both inside and outside all day long, and Lauren has her forever dog. So here it is, these people spent buku bucks on doggy daycare. I mean, the, the owner really went all out to do the right thing, you know, hired a trainer and everything else, and it turns out that it's as simple as installing a dog door. Now, do I think that's going to solve everybody's problem? No, absolutely not. But just another thing to keep in mind if you have this kind of an issue. Okay. Any questions or comments before I move on? Okay. So a lot of times we talk about a scent item, meaning, you know, leave something that smells like you, you know, like the owner, not like you as the trainer, because that really doesn't matter. Something that smells like the owner. Um, and people, I've actually had people ask me, well, how do I do that? <laughs> You know, I don't know, you know, just handle it. You don't, you don't have to like, you know, rub it on your body. But um, I'm so glad this is being videotaped. You don't have to rub it on your body. But, but yeah, I mean, just something that smells like you. And believe me, stuff smells like you, even if you haven't li really tried, you know what I mean? But leave something with the dog. However, this is tricky, and I never hear people talk about this part. If you only leave it with the dog when you're leaving, what does it become? Yeah, it's a cue that you're leaving. So... I'm going to say that when you practice your behavior modification, and even when you're not practicing, wherever it is that that dog's going to be left, leave that scent item in the area. And every now and then handle it to make sure it kind of retains your scent over the weeks and months. But leave it there. Don't just put it there when you're leaving. Uh, it may be something in the bottom of the dog's crate, and that can just stay there. And if it gets washed, make sure you re-scent it. A chew item or treat dispenser. Um, Again, get the dog used to whatever it is you're going to leave them with, Kongs, bully sticks, you know, marrow bones, whatever it is. Make sure that you have them chewing on that stuff when you're home as well so it's not a signal that you're leaving. And I think it's a great idea to time it so that you know. I, with Sierra, I am telling you, I'm like an organized geek, okay? I sat there and made a list of like, you know, marrow bone, 45 minutes. <laughs> bully stick, 25 minutes. You know, I knew exactly. And, you know, stuffed Kong stuffed with will last this much, and if I freeze it, it'll last this much time. Because you want to know, you know, and you want to time things appropriately. So when you're giving the Kongs and the bully sticks and whatever to get the dog used to just having it when you're there, feed it in the alone zone so that the dog gets used to, this is my happy place where all this good stuff happens. Get them used to the alone zone also by doing things like massage or petting, you know, whatever it is that your dog enjoys. Make that their little spa area. If you are going to... Um, do things like playing music for the dog, and we'll, we'll talk about that. When you're gone, play it also when you're home. Again, do this in, in, the, in the alone zone so the dog has good associations. Basically what you're doing is trying to match the conditions as much as possible that are going to happen when you're gone, but when you're home. And it becomes a pleasurable thing. So we're conditioning it. I want to show you, unless there's questions, uh, okay, I want to show you a video, and this is from uh, Danny Weiner, who is from the Netherlands. And this is actually, uh, just so you know, I edited this down because, you know, a lot of these videos, it's like watching paint dry, you know? Um, so I edited this down, it, but so you know, behavior-wise, it was originally 22 minutes, okay? And um, this is Fritz, who is a two-year-old uh, mini schnauzer. Now, she lives in an apartment building where she's walking down the hall, so she's not actually gone yet.
And she did the right thing, by the way, by giving him a toy before she left, not right before she left. So he was involved in it already. So for the next 20 minutes, Fritz paces, whines, howls, and barks. Just basically what you saw here. Interesting, no? Is he frantically greeting her? If she didn't know there was a separation issue, what would she think when she came home? He's fine. He's playing with his thing just like when I left him. Not a problem. Okay? This illustrates, I think very nicely, the importance of videotaping. Okay? Another thing is that Kong wobbler that the dog was using, which I love, by the way. I think it's fabulous. Um, you can put the dog's kibble in there. You can put you know, treats in there or whatever. I think that for some dogs, dogs that are sort of more active, who are going to be left loose like that, it's better to give them something where it's active and they're going to you know, be able to kind of take that anxiety out on the object and move around. If the dog is the type that's just not going to lay, lay down and chew a Kong, this can actually be better. Now, the flip side of that is you could say, yeah, but if they have a Kong, maybe they would lay down and relax. So you really have to know the, inv the individual dog and maybe try it two different ways. But I think anything that, that's sort of active like that is another option. Okay, any questions about that? Oh, good question. Yeah, so the question is, do you think that people who, have, uh, who live in condos and apartments and so forth have a harder time because they hear, you know, the neighbors and outside things? I think they could because they might be thinking, oh, is that my mom coming? Like every time the elevator opens, you know? And if you think about it, if the dog has settled down, that's a really good point. Because, like, let's say this dog settled down, and then he hears the elevator. Now, I tend to think that dogs know <laughs> when it's their person coming back, and I cannot fully explain this, but I'm telling you that even before they hear you walk down the hall, somehow I think a lot of dogs know. But, yeah, I think that it could, theoretically, be harder for the dog, you know? Um, and by the way, also, you know, we all heard the dog doing his wolf impression, right? <laughs> the little howling there. But he was that upset that he was barking and howling. He was obviously, you know, fairly upset, but he was still able to eat, wasn't he? Okay, so again, I think that's really a, a falsity that, that, that the dog is not going to be able to eat at all. Okay, so again, really important. Now, she videotaped this, but in some cases, we are going to want to monitor things in real time. And there's ways to do that. Why would we want to do that? Anybody? Maybe so the dog doesn't destroy the house? Yeah? So, you know, you don't come back to find a dog ate your couch, you know? Um, 
yeah, and what if you're going to put a dog in a crate, but you're not really 100% sure that's the right solution? I want to know if that dog is starting to hurt himself or look like he's going to, I want to get him out of there, right? So, and also, you know, when you're doing your behavior modification protocols, you want to know what's the dog doing before you walk back in because you don't want him going, rrr, 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 and then you come walking back in and he goes, rrr, rrr, is really good, that worked, note to self, you know? So, so how can we do that? Well, there's different ways. And you guys actually all have in your handouts, do you have a page that's, that's uh, just sort of printed text rather than the slides, I hope? Good. Um, and that is actually going to give you sort of technical specifications and so forth. I'm not going to go way, way into all the technical specs here, but I do want to give you an overview. Um, this is also, by the way, you know, helpful when you build up to short absences just to keep tabs on things. So there are a, a wide range of things you can do. Some of them are very inexpensive and some of them can get pretty pricey. And I'm just gonna give you kind of a few suggestions on both ends. So with the sort of less pricey ones, one of the ones that is really easy is the iCam. If you are an Apple person and you have like an iPhone, uh, but this actually works for other phones as well now and, and you don't have to have a Mac, you can do it with a PC. This is um, a still shot actually from their website, not from me. And it's got a pretty good picture, you know? Let me tell you, this is an app that costs you $4.99. Okay, this is, we're, we're going to the lower end here first, okay? So $4.99 and you download the app in the app store just like you would and it pops up on your phone just like it should. And then there's also a, a software thing that you download onto your computer. Okay? And it'll tell you on the website and you have all the information in your notes. And basically the idea is that once you get the setup, which is very easy, it's almost like nothing, you would leave your, you know, most computers nowadays, most laptops have a little built-in camera. If for some reason yours doesn't, you can get a little webcam, you know, and, and hook it up. But you're going to leave that so that it's facing the area where your dog's going to be. And you can actually go out and do your business and, and open the app and see what your dog's doing. That's pretty cool. Now, it's not going to do all the fancy stuff. I mean, it's not going to be rotating and panning and, you know, and all that. But... That's pretty cool for $4.99, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I actually used that one. I, I tried out almost all of these, just so you know, because I didn't want to just tell you to do stuff without trying it first. And, and I've used them with some of my clients. And I, I've got to say, I really like the iCam. You can get into places where if you can't get phone reception, you know, that, then you can have a problem. But, but other than that, I think that's pretty good. Um, also, Skype, how many of you use Skype? For, for just talking to people? Yeah, okay, so cool. And if, if you're not familiar, Skype is really good for video chats and it's free, it's absolutely free. You don't have to pay $4.99 even, which is pretty cool. And what you would do is, and again, this, is, this stuff is easy to set up. I didn't give you any solutions that are difficult and believe me, some of them, it's like you need to be some kind of technical wizard you know, I'm pretty good technically, but some of them to set up, it was like a pain. So this is very simple. And for those of you who are trainers, you know, you can recommend these things to your clients because they're simple and easy for everybody. Um, so Skype, basically, what you do is you sign up for Skype at home. And you have this account that you call, you know, my home account, whatever. And then you set up another Skype account for your mobile device, you know? So let's say you have a laptop with you, you have a phone with you, whatever it is. And you, you have, you know, my mobile account. And then... Essentially, the overview is you're going to call yourself. It's quantum physics. <laughs> you're going to be in two places at once. Um, so yeah, you're going to call yourself at home. The mobile is going to call the home account. The home account is going to say, yes, hello, I'm here. And that is going to be set up, obviously, where it can see the dog. And what happens is, and I've given you the specs, again, you're going to set it up so that the home account can automatically accept incoming calls. Now, if you have a home account and you're used to doing Skype and like, you know, five people a day call you, you don't want to set it up so that it automatically... <laughs> you look different the last time we chatted. <laughs> you're looking a little furry around there, you know? So yeah, you want to make sure that if that's the case, that there are people who call you regularly, you don't want the home just picking up for that. Then you're going to set up a separate home account. It's like, you know, the dog only account or whatever you want to call it. So that it's, on, it's only accepting calls from you for, as the mobile. Does that make sense? 
Okay. The other thing is, <laughs> you want to make sure that you mute the computer. Because guess what happens if you don't? You call home, and you're standing there going, look, he's doing so well. And the dog goes, huh? Mom? Yeah, so you want to make sure it's muted. Um, Skype, I think, is one of the easiest ones to set up. And again, it's free, you know? So any questions on those two before I move on? Okay. And again, you know, you've got to really look at the specifications for these things, and is there sound, and is there not sound, and, and so forth. Um, there are things that you can buy that are little ready-made things. Dropcam and ViewZone, and, and again, being the geek that I am, I spent like hours and hours researching all these different types of cameras and looking at reviews and everything else, and I tried them out. I will tell you that these two are really good. Dropcam and ViewZone, out of all the ones, and there are a lot out there, and I have no affiliation with these companies or anything else. I mean, get whatever you want. Um, but, you know, they're within a certain price range. ViewZone, I think, starts at around $200. Um, Dropcam, I think, is, has a new HD version, and they're down to like 150 or something for pre-orders. But basically, and, and some of this specs that I gave you may be a little out of date by the time, you know, they, they update things, but these are fairly recent. Um, Basically, both of them have something that you would plug in near your computer, like a little router thing that, that um, kind of sets it up. And it's, these two in particular are very easy. Some of them, you've got to know all kinds of things about your ISP and this and this, and frankly, I want to avoid that stuff. So these two are simple. And then they have little cameras. I mean, very small cameras that you set up in different areas. Depending on the brand and so forth, you can buy extra cameras for them to set up in different areas of the house if you need to. Some are indoor, outdoor, some are not. So, you know, basically just check it all out. Um, there are other standalone cameras like the... Um, iBB monitor and the Foscam, they, they make certain ones as well. And some of them really are fancy, like where they'll pan and tilt remotely, you can control that, you know, which is kind of nice. So again, and, and that's the, the view zone, the other one. Yeah, question. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, most of them you can actually record. And what will happen is that it will be sort of on a website and you can download it. I mean, some people have privacy issues because it is going through a website out there somewhere. But, you know, depending on what you're doing in your home <laughs> and what your camera's pointed at, eh, you know, maybe not worrying so much. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions on that? Why you would want to do it, how you would do it, and so forth? I think it's really a valuable tool, you know, to do that in real time, other than just videotaping it. So I want to talk about behavior modification, because, you know, we've talked about sort of management every day, which is really important, and where to keep the dog when you're gone, which is really important. But now, what else can we do to make this better? So, first of all, departure cues. Do you guys all know what departure cues are, what I mean by that? For those of you who don't, departure cues are those things that tell your dog that you're getting ready to leave. Most of us have sort of like a routine, and especially if you're going to work every day, you know, you do certain things in the morning. You get up, you take a shower, you dry your hair, you eat breakfast, you read the paper, you know, whatever it is. And then we have the departure cues that get closer to your actual departure time, which are things like putting on your jacket, picking up a briefcase or a purse, picking up your keys, you know, and so forth, whatever else you do. So there are some dogs who really start to get stressed when they see us starting to do these things. And what do they do? They just get a little antsy. They start being really clingy. They may whine, you know. Now, that said, there are other dogs who don't do that at all. You know, I'll tell you, Sierra, it was a very strange case. We talked a little bit before about how dogs can get hyper-attached, right, the ones that follow you everywhere. Sierra loves to be outside. And where I live, there's lots of critters, you know, in the hill. We're right up against the mountains. And there's bunnies, and there's lizards, and there's mice. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. So it's like Disneyland for dogs, right? So dog TV, 24-7. And she loves to just lay out on the ramp and watch. She's very predatory, and this is like a big thrill. She would rather, as long as she knows that I'm in the house, she would rather be out there. So not hyper-attached that way. Do I have to practice departure cues? I don't think so. Because she's not whining and pacing and everything else. She's just like, oh, crap, you, the door clicked, you're leaving, you know? So for a dog like that, no, you don't have to. But if your dog really does start getting upset at that, then, yeah, you do have to desensitize them to departure cues. Now, if you really don't know what all your departure cues are, because you never really thought about it, set up a little video camera 
and go about your business and then watch it back and go, okay, I do this, I do this, I do this, right? For most people, it's going to be things like picking up the keys, putting on their jacket, pretty typical, picking up your purse or, or your briefcase, right? So what do you want to do? Bunch of times a day, just go, pick up the keys. The dog's like, oh, the keys. Oh, put them back down. That was weird, right? So you go, you do it again. They're like, wow. And you know what? By the 50th time you do that, the dog's like, eh, it's no big deal, you know? And you do it at random times throughout the day. It's not you stand there and 50 times, you know. <laughs> okay, I'm not suggesting that. Just randomly throughout the day. It doesn't have to be 50 times. Put on your jacket. Take it off. Do this, do that. So we're desensitizing the dog to the different cues separately, right? Away from each other. And then once the dog is totally fine, no reaction, start putting them together. So now maybe I put on my jacket and then get my keys. Maybe I put on my jacket, then get my keys and walk towards the door. So I'm kind of building up gradually. And yes, it's a pain in the butt. And yes, if you, you know, by the time you get to where you're actually like going out the door and then coming back in, your neighbors think you're insane, right? But again, this really helps with some dogs. Now I have heard some people, some behavior people recently saying, behavior, you know, departure cues, no. They've, we've always heard that they, you have to desensitize them, but no, you don't, that doesn't do anything. I'm here to tell you that for a lot of dogs, it helps. You know, a lot of my clients' dogs, it's definitely helped. So again, I'm all about things that are not going to hurt and may help. So yes, it won't help with every dog, but yes, absolutely worth doing. Um, also, com combine them, but also scramble the order of them also. That can really help. That can make a big difference. Now, we have, if you're thinking about a dog who is hyper-attached, you're leaving the house, right? But if you can't even leave the room, you have to start there, right? Because some dogs, they do not want to let you out of their visual line of sight ever. And it's really stressful for them, even if you just go, you know, take a shower or use the bathroom or whatever. So we have to start where wherever the dog is at. So if you have a dog like that, we're going to start with just visual separations, okay? Or physical separations. You can't even be like on the other side of something. You have to start somewhere. And the place to start with those dogs is not leaving the house. So... Let's say that you're starting with physical or visual separations. We're going to put the dog in the alone zone, which you've conditioned him to, right? His happy place. And we're going to maybe just sit. Let's say I have the, the, the gate up and the dog's in the kitchen. And here's my dining table. I might just sit here and read, okay? I'm going to give him something nice to chew on. Hopefully he'll be calm enough with that, right? But I'm just going to sit here and read. Now, am I going to do it for an hour? No. I'm going to do it for a very short time the first time, okay? And I'm going to get up and let him out, and I'm not going to make a big deal. I'm not going to talk to him while I'm doing this. I'm not going to say, you're okay over there, or anything like that. I'm, your demeanor as the owner is one of the biggest factors in this whole thing. You know, you think about the woman that we had on that video earlier and her doing this. I mean, she wouldn't be able to help it, honestly. She would just, because she's so attached, she would be like, oh, it's okay, don't worry, you know. And of course, what's that going to do? It's going to stress the dog out. So it's no big deal. The dog sees that it's no big deal. They take their cues from you. So the dog is sitting there, and, and again, I, I want him to have something that will keep him busy chewing, something that he's really interested in. Um, after a few minutes, let the dog out. Don't pay any attention to him. You go in there, you go out of there, it's no big deal. Obviously, we're going to play with criteria here, like the amount of time th th that the dog is in there. And then you can also do things like after a while, you know, get up. And of course, now the dog's like, oh, she's getting up, right? So get up, stretch, go sit, sit back down again. Get up, walk around, go sit back down again. So that's other criteria that you can play with. Now, you can get to the point where the dog is calm. And again, we always want the dog to be under threshold. We don't want him to, you know, start barking or getting stressed at all if we can help it. So... And if he does, we've got to regroup and think, okay, that was too much. We have to go back to where he was successful and build small steps from there, just like anything else in behavior modification. So now let's say that um, I've got this sort of corner where I can be out of, the dog's, out of the dog's sight, and I've done my standing up, walking around. He's like, yeah, okay, she's that crazy person doing that again. I don't know why. I'm going back to my Kong. That's great. So now I'm going to walk. I'm going to disappear just for like that long and come back. I mean, literally like a second and come back. And the dog's like, oh, that's cool. And then I'm going to make it longer. Now, I don't want it to become longer, like in a straight line of duration. I don't want it to be, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, because then, then the dog just learns that you're gone longer and longer every time. That's not good. We want to stagger 
the durations. So maybe it's, you know, 30 seconds, and then maybe it's 15 seconds, and then a minute, and then, you know, and so forth, back and forth. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, good. Um, so again, we're going to extend the difficulty and the duration very gradually. And when you start, and, and you're going to keep your sessions fairly short. Okay, you don't have to do this for an hour. This is, this is going to be short, and it's going to depend on the dog, but just a few minutes is fine at first. Um, when you start the next session, let's say that you got up to the point where, and, and you may not get to this point for every dog, of course, but let's say you got to the point where you were around the corner and you were hidden for like three minutes and the dog was fine with it. When you start your next session, do you think it's a good idea to start with three minutes around the corner? No. You want to start somewhere easier, a little bit easier for the dog. Okay, you don't have to go back to square one, but just kind of take it down a few notches and then build back up and, and past where you were at. Now, um, you can also, for visual separations, you can also have the dog on a downstay. For a lot of dogs, if they have something to concentrate on, something to focus on, and especially, you know, you have like a border call or something, you know, a dog that's like always thinking, you, it, they may do a lot better if you put them in a downstay and then do your visual separations because the dog's like, I'm here, I'm doing my job. Oh, yeah, I forgot to freak out, right? Because they're not going to be spiraling out of control emotionally if they are still kind of in their cognitive, functioning, focused mind. All right, so, um, so we talked about uh, timing out, right, the, the marrow bones and the Kongs and so forth, so that when you're gone longer, the dog still has something. I do want to mention something. Y you may have read, and I certainly read in the liter literature, that when you are gone, you know, you're, you've given your Kong or your marrow bone or whatever, and you're, it's something your dog really loves, right? And, and let's say he's happily chewing on it. When you come back, there's a lot of recommendations out there that you should go over and take the thing away from him, right? And the idea being, which makes sense, what? That the dog learns to associate your absences with really good stuff happening. And that logically makes total sense. But, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? Okay, here's some of you do. What can happen with some dogs? Sierra never had any kind of issues with it's my stuff or I could take anything away from her. But let me tell you, when I started coming home and going towards the, the Kong, all of a sudden her head was lowered and there was this. Okay? And, and we, we put that, to, you know, stop to that immediately. But I'm going to tell you that you can actually create a guarding issue in a dog where there previously wasn't any. So, yeah, you came back and, okay, I'm happy to see you, but you take my stuff away? Not cool. So I'd rather time things out to where, I mean, obviously you can't get it perfect, to where it's about, you know, coinciding. And the thing is, you're always giving something when you leave anyway, so it's still getting associated with your absence. So just something to be aware of. All right. Um, also, there are some dogs who, I, I mean, I think it's very important to give the dog something to chew on when you're gone. There are some dogs who will not chew on things to begin with. There are dogs, like, you know, when I got Sierra, she, you know, if you met her now, I mean, she's happy, she loves everybody, it's great. But when I got her, she was kind of shut down in certain ways. And what I mean is, you know, for example, I was doing, you know, obedience training with her, and we were doing downstays, and I'm very soft-spoken when I'm training and very, you know, calm and, and positive trainer, obviously. But I gave her a hand signal for stay, and my hand signal was literally like this. It's like, stay. I mean, that's pretty, you know, calm and, and gentle. And her ears flattened, and she, her eyes squinted, and she did that thing that some people think is a dog smiling, but it's really like, I think you're going to hit me kind of look. And I thought, wow, what happened to you? You know, it was really sad. And so it took a while for her to feel okay with doing things, and like we weren't mad at her. I don't know what's happened in her past. Um, but she was almost like afraid to try things. And like clicker training wasn't going to happen with her at the beginning because she would not offer a behavior because she was too, it was almost like learned helplessness. You know, she was like, I'm afraid to try anything because if I do the wrong thing, you might punish me. And, you know, I, there's nothing I could do, so I may as well not try. Um, but she was afraid or I don't, whatever it was that she would not even try to unstuff a Kong. She wouldn't do anything. And I really had to try different things, you know. And so the things, well, the thing that really worked with her was, you know, those little frosty paws. It's like ice cream for dogs. And okay, it's not the healthiest thing out there. But 
I really needed her to like something, you know. And that was the thing, because all she had to do, it was like ice cream in a cup, you know, uh, for dogs, of course. And, and she started on that, and then I did things like smearing peanut butter on a bully stick to make it really enticing, and then once she had the peanut butter off, she would really start. So sometimes you have to be creative about it. Um, one thing that you can do also that I find helpful is if you are going to leave the dog with a Kong, let's say you, you've frozen stuff in a Kong and you know that's going to last longer and that's great, but you really want to get the dog interested in it or it's what's the point. So what you can do is have the Kong there, but also have a little trail of treats of really super yummy stuff leading to the Kong. Because that way, the dog who might not say, oh, there's the Kong, let me go lay down and chew it, that dog might still say, oh, hot dog, you know, oh, another, and then getting to the Kong, and that will actually ease them into chewing on it. That could be really useful. So let's say that your dog is at the point where he's used to your departure cues. They don't bother him anymore. He's like, fine, it's the crazy lady picking up the keys, whatever. Um, physical separations, you can be out of sight. You have a little distance physically from the dog. That's great. Now, at some point, you have to leave the house, right? So now we're going to do not really leaving, going anywhere, but the little faux go, as I call it. And this is where we start. You know, you've gotten to the point where you've, you can, like, put your hand on the door. You can twist the knob. Everything's good. Like, it's part of your departure cues. So now we're going to actually have the dog in their alone zone, do all the stuff you would usually do, and then go out the door, close the door, and guess what? Come right back in. Yeah, this is where your neighbors start going. She must have really become forgetful, <laughs> right? So you're going to come right back in. Um, you're going to do this uh, for a while. So you're going to build up the time you're out there, and again, you're going to stagger the duration. Don't, don't just make it longer and longer each time. I would say that once you can be out there for about 10 seconds, and remember, you can monitor... Right? You can have your Skype or your iCam or whatever set up. Once you can remain out there for about 10 seconds, I would say start to add in the walking away. So like if you're in an apartment building, you know, the dog's going to hear your, your heels on, on the concrete floor or whatever or on the hallway. Um, if you are in a house where you park, let's say you have the garage or the carport or whatever, this is where you would start like walking to the car. And eventually you're going to add in things like the car door opening and closing without you going anywhere. You know, we're just breaking everything down into its components as much as possible. From there, you might have to do things like turning on the engine, turning off the engine. Um, if you have a garage door, garage door going up and down. Again, just break everything down into as small components as possible. And yes, I know that it's a lot to ask people to do all this stuff. I get it, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, like, who the hell is going to do all that? You know who's going to do it? The owner of a dog who has separation anxiety, who really loves their dog and really wants to make this work. Because yes, it takes time, but, and I'm going to give you some ideas also that are just kind of overall helpful, that can be kind of shortcuts for some dogs, but as far as the actual protocols, these can be really helpful. Any question about those yet? Yes. Okay, really great question. So his question is when you've got the dog in their alone zone and you're up to leaving for maybe 10 seconds uh, and you've got your monitoring device, are you looking for the dog to be really involved in the Kong or whatever you left him? Or are you looking for him to just be, you know, standing there without barking? It, <laughs> I hate to say it depends, but it depends on the dog because if the dog originally is the kind of dog who you know, right away gets really upset because there are some dogs that immediately go into whatever it is and he seems like, he's just standing there or he's just laying there and wow, that's good for that dog. That's really relaxed. Then that's what I want to see. Uh, I want to see the behavior, basically the answer is, that is showing me relaxed behavior for that particular dog. You know, and for some dogs it will be, yeah, they start chewing the Kong. 